welcome everyone. Um, we'll begin the webinar. I want to thank everyone for taking the time to join us tonight. This is the second in the series sponsored by the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and organized through the Task Force on Quality Improvement. I want to give a special thanks tonight to our experts, Drs. Lazar and Fernery, who have certainly spent a lot of time preparing and making this uh, interesting subject approachable for everyone. I just wanted to take a second to let everybody know um, how many people are participating, and it's really quite overwhelming. We've had, in the first two, 860 different sites and over 900 individuals from 18 countries. Tonight, I want to take a moment to thank those from Argentina, Brazil, Canada, Switzerland, Egypt, Germany, Israel, Jordan, Kenya, Malaysia, and South Korea, in addition to all those participating from the United States. I'm Dr. Lobdell, and I'm here in Charlotte, North Carolina. I have no disclosures and a few announcements. The recording of this webinar will be posted on the SDS website next month. All participant lines will be muted for the duration of the webinar and will accept questions, as you can see, that will be submitted at any time during the webinar and will discuss those at the completion. Next slide. To begin with, we'll have an overview to frame this subject. As we all know, hyperglycemia is common in stress patients, particularly those who have had myocardial infarction, surgery, trauma, and in general, the critically ill. Normal glycemia is associated with improved outcomes after myocardial infarction, surgery, which includes cardiac surgery, trauma, and the critically ill. And then just a little bit of housekeeping with the American Diabetes Association criteria for the diagnosis of diabetes. Hemoglobin A1C greater than or equal to 6.5%, fasting plasma glucose greater than 126 milligram percent, two-hour plasma glucose greater than or equal to 200 milligram percent during an oral glucose tolerance test, or a random plasma glucose greater than or equal to 200 milligram percent. Next slide. In the 1990s, the Portland Diabetes Project demonstrated a reduction in mediastinitis and mortality in cardiac surgery on diabetic patients. Around 2001, Vandenberg presented their findings on intensive insulin therapy to maintain glucose at or below 110 milligram percent in its correlation with reducing morbidity and mortality among critically ill patients in the surgical intensive care unit. Next slide. In 2009, uh, Dr. Lazar Fernery et al. published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery the STS Practice Guideline Series, and specifically they reviewed and addressed detrimental effects of hyperglycemia in the perioperative period beneficial effects of glycemic control on clinical outcomes during cardiac surgery, glycemic control in patients without diabetes during cardiac surgery, management of hyperglycemia using insulin protocols in the perioperative period, preoperative management and assessment for patients with diabetes, and then methods to control in the different sites intraoperatively, the ICU, and step-down units in, at the time of discharge. Next slide. The Nice Sugar Study Investigators published in the New England Journal in 2009 and found that intensive glucose control increased mortality among adults in the ICU. A blood glucose target of 180 milligram percent or less resulted in lower mortality than did a target of 81 to 108. And then the Society of Critical Care Medicine, through their journal Critical Care Medicine, published guidelines in 2012 on the use of insulin fusion for the management of hyperglycemia in critically ill patients with the following recommendations. The trigger glucose should be approximately 150 milligram percent. Control should be less than 150 milligram percent and absolutely less than 180. 
believe that it reduces mortality in general ICU patients, reduces morbidity in perioperative, postoperative cardiac surgery, post-trauma, and neurologically injured patients, monitoring to avoid and minimize hypoglycemia and variability is important, reliable protocol and frequent glucose monitoring is important, and also recommended that we avoid finger sticks. Next slide. So tonight, with Dr. Fernery and Dr. Lazar, we intend to address and stimulate thought, questions, and dialogue regarding outcomes, biochemistry, and physiology, variables that include protocol, the glucose metrics, variability, and also quality, for instance, the surgical care improvement project, current and future. Again, I want to thank everyone for participating in this multidisciplinary effort and thank our experts, Dr. Lazar Fernery and Dr. Prager, as well as the task force, and also importantly, Jane Hahn, for helping us make all of this possible. So without any further ado, Dr. Fernery. Thanks very much, uh, Kevin. So these are my disclosures. Um, since 1995, when our Portland Diabetes Project began to publish on the beneficial effects of tight glycemic control in diabetic cardiac surgery patients, there have been hundreds of publications on the benefits and the risks of glycemic control with intravenous insulin in hospitalized patients. And I believe, you know, all of us can agree that some degree of glycemic control is good. But as Kevin just noted, there are some recent studies that have caused confusion and raised some concern. So today we want to clear up some of that confusion and concern for our particular patient population, the cardiac surgery patient population. So in this section of the webinar, we're going to examine which cardiac surgery outcomes are affected by tight glycemic control and in which cardiac surgery patients those outcome effects apply. We'll then look at historical STS data on those patients and on those outcomes. And we'll examine the biochemical mechanisms of action of glycemic control on those outcomes. We'll try to determine a meaningful blood glucose target and decide how long we should maintain that target and thus where we should be doing high glycemic control. So let's start by looking at which clinical outcomes are proven to be altered by tight glycemic control in the various patient populations of hospitalized patients. In the left-hand column of this chart are the numerous outcomes purported to be improved by glycemic control. Across the top are the four main hospital populations in which TGC has been claimed to show benefit. The diabetes cabbage data comes from our Portland studies, Dr. Lazar studies in Boston, and the Kurtimer randomized trial of the Portland protocol in diabetic cabbage patients. The next two columns are Vandenberg's randomized Leuven 1 and 2 studies like Kevin mentioned, that were done in SICU and MICU patients who are on supplemental parenteral nutrition, or D10. And in the last column are the Bolada studies, and this, this is neurosurgery patients that were studied in South America. The level of evidence for each outcome is, uh, or the strength of data in each population in each column will be shown in the indicated colors below the level of evidence A, B, and C, and we're now going to fill in this table. Glycemic control definitively improves hospital mortality in diabetes cabbage and ICU patients on supplemental parenteral nutrition, or D10, but it doesn't improve neurosurgical mortality. The incidence of surgical wound infections are significantly decreased by glycemic control in the surgical population, but there's no infection protection benefit in the medical population. Lazar and Kurtermeyer's work show decreased new onset atrial fibrillation in diabetes cabbage, and ICU stay was definitively reduced in the ICU populations on parenteral nutrition, or D10, but total stay was only possibly reduced in the cabbage patient cohort. Improvements in kidney injury or acute kidney injury, post-discharge survival, and transfusion rates are suggested but not yet proven and may just be association but decreases in respiratory failure and polyneuropathy have only been shown in one study each and only in long-term ICU patients on parenteral nutrition, or D10. So from this, this is the summary of the data. And what can we really glean from all this? Well, first and foremost, glycemic control is not a panacea. It won't cure anything, and it won't cure everything. And there's no evidence that it decreases stroke, 
neuropathy or respiratory failure. It might decrease kidney injury, transfusion rates, and long-term survival in specific populations, but these may only be associations and causality is not, isn't proven. However, tight glycemic control definitely improves surgical wound infection rates, hospital mortality, and new onset atrial fibrillation and diabetes cavus patients, and it improves mortality and length of ICU stay in ICU patients on supplemental parental nutrition, or D10. Now, which cardiac surgery outcomes are altered by TGC? Because most of us are cardiac surgeons, and we really want to know about this patient population. So let's eliminate the non-cardiac surgery studies for now and ask, in which other cardiac surgery patients do these outcome effects apply? So we're going to repopulate our top row. Importantly, as we repopulate this top row, deep sternal wound infection rates were decreased with tight glycemic control in diabetes valve patients in our Portland studies, but no other outcome has ever been claimed or proven to change in that population by us or anyone else. Importantly, in both the non-diabetes cabbage and the non-diabetes valve populations, no beneficial effects of glycemic control have ever been shown in any study. The only proven beneficial effects of TTC in cardiac surgery are in the cardiac surgery patients with diabetes. So TTC has no proven benefit in cardiac surgery patients without diabetes, and this is an important point. But there's also no proven mortality benefit in any valve population, including those with diabetes. So in summary, in cardiac surgery, tight glycemic control has no proven mortality benefit unless you have both diabetes and undergo cabbage. Therefore, cardiac surgery studies that claim that tight glycemic control doesn't work, but whose study populations include non-diabetes patients, diabetes valve patients without cabbage, and unproven outcome endpoints in their analyses are really moot because they're claiming to disprove something that's never been claimed or proven in the first place. So what can we count on in terms of glycemic control and cardiac surgery? Well, let's eliminate the unproven, non-causal level B outcomes for diabetes cabbage and focus on just the level A outcomes that are proven. And we're left with really three things, mortality, infection, and new onset atrial fibrillation in diabetes cabbage patients. So what are the STS data on these diabetic cabbage outcomes? Well, although the prevalence of diabetes in the U.S. population is now only 8.3%, I say only, but it's up to 8.3%, in our cardiac surgery population, it's 33%. And in our, in our cabbage population, it's 38%. So it's one of the most prevalent diseases that we as cardiac surgeons see and treat. And it, in fact, it ranks fourth in the list of all comorbidities in the STS database behind coronary disease, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and in front of all other valvular disease combined. So this is a pretty important disease. In the era before glycemic control, diabetes patients had a threefold higher risk of developing mediate stenitis. In that same era, they had a 40% higher risk of death following cabbage. Um, but in the last decade, with wider adoption of glycemic control, that difference in mortality rates has now been reduced to about 25%, but this diabetes disadvantage has yet to be eliminated. Yet to be eliminated. Sorry. So how does glycemic control reduce surgical wound infections, or what's the, what are the mechanisms of action? I'm going to look at this in two, in two ways. First, we're going to look at infection, then we'll look at mortality. So it turns out that hyperglycemia impairs our immune function. And at a concentration between 10 and 12 millimoles, or 180 to 216 milligrams per deciliter, a process called non-enzymatic glycation of proteins takes place. And simply stated, this is just the attachment of glucose molecules to proteins in our body. And you all know this because, as an example, hemoglobin A1C is glycosylated hemoglobin. And glycation of proteins alters their function. In terms of our immune system, gly glycosylation of proteins inactivates IgG, decreases complement fixation, increases collagenase activity, which breaks down collagen, and impairs the ability of leukocytes to find and destroy bacteria. 
And all these processes have been shown in the laboratory to start at 10 millimoles and accelerate at 12 millimoles. And this biochemical physiology is exactly what plays out clinically. This is a low S regression curve, or essentially a moving average, comparing the incidence of mediastinitis to the average glucose level in 7,000 diabetes cardiac surgery patients from our Portland Diabetes Project. As you can see, the curve is essentially flat to about 175 milligrams per deciliter, where the risk starts to increase. And then that risk accelerates at 209 milligrams per deciliter, which exactly corroborates the mechanisms I just described from the, from the bench laboratory. So how does tight glycemic control reduce mortality in diabetes cabbage patients? So to understand this, one really needs to understand the metabolism of myocardiocyte. And this is a depiction of a myocardiocyte. And imagine the, uh, the blue line over here is the cell membrane, the outer portion of the cell membrane, and the orange portion is the mitochondrial membrane. So in normal myocardial metabolism, Insulin causes binding of blood glucose to the cell membrane, where it's phosphorylated and brought into the cytosol as phosphorylated glucose. This phosphorylated glucose then undergoes the process of anaerobic glycolysis to produce pyruvate. Pyruvate then passively diffuses or kind of oozes across the mitochondrial membrane, where it's acted on by pyruvate dehydrogenase to produce acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA is, is like the fuel, it's the gasoline for our mitochondrial engine that makes ATP. But we can also get fuel from another source, from, and multiple other sources. And the most important other source is from free fatty acids. Free fatty acids, which are long 32, 36, or 40 carbon chains, are actively transported across the mitochondrial membrane using ATP, where they then undergo a refining process within the mitochondria that's called beta-oxidation. This process uses ATP and oxygen to break down the long carbon chains into two-chain acetyl-CoA. In normal myocardial metabolism, about 35% of our acetyl-CoA fuel comes from anaerobic glycolysis over here, and about 60% comes from the beta-oxidation of free fatty acids. Now, all this fuel, this acetyl-CoA, is then pumped through the Krebs cycle, where it throws off hydrogen ions into the oxidative phosphorylation pathway, which, when combined with oxygen, produces ATP. I like to say that this slide is kind of like a, the first term of biochemistry in one slide. And it's important because now the changes that occur are the cause of the mortality. So we see in patients with diabetes, whether you're insulin deficient or insulin resistant, there's a lack of bioavailable insulin at the cellular level. And when that happens, Cytosolic glucose transport is impaired, and glucose levels rise. Pyruvate dehydrogenase is deactivated, and pyruvate levels rise. And that shuts down anaerobic glycolysis in the process. So to make up for this deficiency in mitochondrial fuel, there's an upregulation in free fatty acid oxidation. So in poorly controlled diabetic patients, up to 90% of our energy can come from free fatty acid oxidation. And this upregulation increases the oxygen demand and consumption of the cardiomyocyte, which is all well and good, unless, of course, there's concomitant ischemia. Now, in patients who have both diabetes and ischemia, there's a problem. As you all know, ischemia is the lack of bioavailable oxygen at the cellular level. And without enough oxygen available, oxidative phosphorylation slows, and acetyl-CoA now starts to build up in the mitochondria. And as the acetyl-CoA builds up, the process of beta-oxidation goes awry. And instead of breaking down into two-chain acetyl-CoA, the free fatty acids are broken down into four, six, eight, twelve-chain carbons called free fatty acid intermediates. And it turns out that these intermediates build up in the myocardia, and they're toxic to the cell. The buildup of free fatty acid intermediates within the mitochondria, along with the down-regulation of cytosolic glycolysis, have been shown in the laboratory to do all of the following things. Decreased cytosolic glycolysis causes cellular membrane dysfunction, causing cellular edema. Free fatty acid intermediates are direct negative inotropes. You all know what a positive inotrope is. These are negative inotropes. They cause acute ventricular failure and isolated rat heart. They also cause free radicals, which are directly toxic to the myocardium. Both decreased anaerobic glycolysis 
and free fatty acid intermediates are independently arrhythmogenic. That is, they cause VTAC, ventricular fibrillation, and atrial fibrillation in isolated rat heart models. And both also cause endothelial dysfunction. So not only do we get cellular edema, but we also get interstitial edema. But all we see as clinicians is hyperglycemia. But that hyperglycemia ought to be like a tachometer connected to the engine of the cell. And what it's telling us is that there's decreased cytosolic glycolysis and upregulation of free fatty acid utilization, which increases myocardial oxygen consumption at a time when there's less oxygen available in the post-ischemic state. So the higher the glucose levels go, the more of this we should see. And the more of this we should see, we see, the higher the mortality should be, which is exactly what multiple studies have shown in diabetes cabbage patients. But what type of mortality should go up? Well, we're talking about the myocardium. So if we look at these same mortality graphs and divide them into cardiac-related mortality, arrhythmias and pump failure, and non-cardiac-related mortality, we see that the non-cardiac-related mortality is flat to about 175 milligrams per deciliter, and it just stays flat or rises slightly thereafter. And most of these are deaths from infection. But almost the entire increase in the mortality is due to a steady rise in cardiac-related mortality, an increase in arrhythmias and pump failure as the glucose rises, which corroborates the mechanisms I just described. So now we're going to do two things to search. We're going to do two things to fix the problem. First, we're going to do something that's always been done for years. We're going to do coronary bypass, which eliminates the ischemia and restores the oxidative phosphorylation pathway and lowers acetyl-CoA levels in the mitochondria. Then we're going to do something that hadn't been done before until the mid-1990s. We're going to create a state of hyperphysiologic insulinemia with intravenous insulin direct, direct, delivered directly to the cell. This drives glucose back into the cell, reactivates pyruvate dehydrogenase, and thus reactivates and turbocharges anaerobic glycolysis. Now our mitochondria is getting so much acetyl-CoA from anaerobic glycolysis that it downregulates free fatty acid oxidation. It actually turns off the transportation. And when this happens, the free fatty acid intermediates go away. That downregulation of free fatty acid metabolism should result in a marked reduction in cardiac-related mortality, which is exactly what happens. Death due to arrhythmias and pump failure decreased threefold when we went from subcutaneous insulin delivery, which was ineffective, to continuous intravenous insulin de delivery direct to the cell. And that's the mechanism of mortality protection in diabetes cabbage, a downregulation of free fatty acid metabolism. So then how low should we really go? How low do we go with blood glucose? The question really comes down to how low do we have to go to achieve optimal glucose-related outcomes? And for new onset atrial fibrillation, these are the glucose-related outcomes. For new onset atrial fibrillation, there really are no data. For the surgical infection outcome, for surgical wound infections, as we've seen, we just have to see glucose less than 180. So the how low do we go question really comes down to what's the blood glucose level that optimizes mortality in the diabetes cabbage patient. And we have those data from the Portland Diabetes Project, and they look like this. The nadir mortality for the day of surgery glucose is 118 milligrams per deciliter, the lowest mortality. The lowest mortality glucose for first post-operative day is 104 milligrams per deciliter. Now, in order to hit those desired glucose levels, we apparently have to aim low. So these are the target glucose ranges of the 12 most quoted insulin protocols. And these triangles, can I get, there you go, and those triangles that just popped on the screen are the achieved average glucose levels of each study. And I want you all to note that there's only three study protocols, Portland, the Leuven 1 study, and the Bellata study, that actually achieved their target ranges. Every other study had an average glucose level higher than their target range. So the moral of all this is if we want to do this, we have to aim for a lower glucose target than the actual glucose we want to achieve. So how long do we have to maintain these levels? Well, in Portland, we measured glucose with the Portland Protocol every 30 minutes to two hours per protocol, preferentially using arterial, venous, or capillary blood in that order. 
And then all these glucose results from the day of surgery, first, second, third, fourth, post-operative days, and so on, are collected, and an average for each day is calculated. Then we take the average of these first three days and determine what we call the 3BG, or the three-day average post-operative glucose. This 3BG is made up of as many as 72, but no fewer than 24 measures of glucose over this three-day period. And it's thus a highly accurate representation of the glycemic state of each and every patient. Now, if we look at the various components of glucose metrics, from hemoglobin A1C on your left to 3BG to all the daily glucose levels in relation to outcome, we see that in the era of glycemic control, hemoglobin A1C levels have absolutely no bearing on infectious outcome. But as we've repeatedly shown, 3BG is a highly significant predictor of infection. And these are the, these are the data for deep sternal wound infection. But also, preoperative glucose, day of surgery, first, second, and even third postoperative day glucose levels are all independently predictive of deep sternal wound infection or mediastinitis. The individual glucose metrics for mortality are similar to these. 3BG is a highly significant predictor of mortality, but both A1C and preoperative glucose aren't significant for mortality. But all the components of 3BG, the day of surgery, the first, and the second postoperative day glucose levels are also independent predictors of death following coronary bypass in patients with diabetes. So really what this means is that there's a time component, a duration to the glycemic control, uh, to the glycemic risk for death and infection in cardiac surgery. And the temporal independent risks are shown here in yellow for each outcome. And this is why we came up with the term 3BG in 1998, because the duration is as important as the glucose level, or as I like to say, the 3 is just as important as the BG. There's a duration component and a glucose component. So if, one want, if you want to really want to eliminate the incremental risk of infection and death, then you need to treat every component of the risk. And it's important to know that duration of insulin therapy matters. In fact, this same data was actually shown in the Lubin 1 data in 2001, but they didn't even realize it. These are the reported overall reductions in the various outcomes in the Lubin 1 SICU study for the study overall. But the outcomes of patients who are in the ICU for less than five days and thus on insulin fusion for less than five days duration weren't significant at all between the study group and the control group. In fact, the significant results of that study were confined to the group of patients who were in the ICU and on the drip for longer than five days, corroborating our own theory on duration of therapy. And these results were so strong that they conferred statistical significance to the entire study group, even though there were no significant differences in those staying less than five days. So where should we practice glycemic control? Where should we do it? Well, the answer now becomes pretty easy. We look at our Portland population of cardiac surgery patients and track the timing of discharge from the ICU. We see that 34% of the patients leave the ICU by the end of the first postoperative day, and 70% are discharged by the end of the second postoperative day. So if you want to cover every component of the glycemic risk, which lasts until the third postoperative day, then you and I and we all have to be doing glycemic control outside of the ICU and on the floor. And this is exactly what we've done in Portland. Beginning in 1995, we've used insulin infusions outside the ICU on the telemetry floors to cover all the components of glycemic risk. And when we move the Portland protocol out of the unit and onto the floors is when we completely eliminated the increased risk of mortality in the diabetes cabbage population. Because when you cover every component of the risk, the risk goes away. And this is why I like to say that the three is just as important as the BG. So to conclude my section of the webinar, we've shown that glycemic control less than 180 milligrams per deciliter reduces mediastinitis in patients with diabetes. We've shown that tight glycemic control reduces mortality in diabetes cabbage patients. Duration of glycemic control is as important as glucose target level because three days of control are needed for optimal outcomes. And therefore, tight glycemic control is really a therapy of duration. It's not a therapy of location. It's not just for the ICU. It's for all the patients. And there is a duration of therapy just like there's a duration to antibiotic therapy. 
glycemic control has to continue outside of the ICU to be fully effective. And finally, the optimal metric to assess tight glycemic efficiency in the cardiac surgery patient population is 3BG. So at this point, I'd like to turn it over to Harold for his section of the webinar. Okay, thank you very much, Joni. Have the next slide, please. And uh, have the next slide. While there is general consensus that glycemic control improved outcomes in diabetic cabbage patients, several issues still remain regarding perioperative glucose management. In my section of the talk, I will briefly review the current SPF guidelines for perioperative glycemic control, discuss aggressive versus moderate glycemic control, attempt to answer the question how relevant are the current SKIP guidelines to glycemic control in our practices, and discuss a plan for implementing glycemic control in the perioperative period that you might find useful in your own practices. Next slide, please. Um, next slide after that. Next slide. The um, STS workforce and evidence-based surgery now recommends that blood glucose be kept less than 180 during cardiac surgery and during the time that patients are in intensive care unit by using continuous insulin infusion. Next slide. While our own group and others have practiced moderate glycemic control, keeping glucose values between 120 and 180, other studies have suggested that maintaining glucose levels below 120 may result in even better outcomes. The Vandenbach trial found that cardiac surgical patients required three or more days of ventilation had significantly lower mortality if their blood glucose was maintained between 80 and 110. And the DCCT trial in non-surgical patients showed that intensive glycemic control also decreased the incidence of microvascular complications. However, recent trials in both the ICU and non-ICU patients have raised concerns that more aggressive glycemic control may actually increase mortality from cardiovascular disease and increase the episodes of hypoglycemia. Next slide. We therefore undertook a study to determine whether aggressive glycemic control would result in more optimal clinical outcomes and less morbidity that can be achieved with moderate glycemic control in diabetic patients undergoing cabbage surgery. Next slide. 82 patients were randomized to receive either moderate glycemic control, ranging from 120 to 180, or aggressive control, ranging from 90 to 120. Infusions continued throughout the period of cardiopulmonary bypass and cardioplegic arrest, following the discontinuation of bypass in the operating room, and for 18 hours in the ICU. During surgery, blood glucose was monitored every 30 minutes and every hour in the ICU. Next slide. This slide looked at the level of serum glucose prior to, during, and following cardiopulmonary bypass and for 18 hours in the ICU. In this as in the following slide, the moderate group is shown in the purple and the aggressive group is in blue. Now, both groups had similar glucose levels at the time of anesthetic induction. Glucose levels were increased in both groups during bypass but we're maintaining the appropriate range for each group during the 18 hours in the ICU. At the end of 18 hours, the moderate group had a mean serum glucose of 135 versus 103 in the aggressive group. Next slide. There's no difference in the primary endpoints between the two groups. There's a higher incidence of MIs in the aggressive group and more atrial fibrillation in the moderate group, but none of these outcomes achieved significant. Next slide. Time on the ventilator, weight gain, the need for isotropic support for more than 24 hours, and the length of stay in the ICU and hospital are similar between the two groups. Next slide. The incidence of hypoglycemic event, defined as less than 70, is shown in this slide. The number of events is shown on the x-axis and the percent of patients Experiencing these events is shown on the y-axis. 90% of patients in the moderate group had no hypoglycemic event, compared to only 25% of patients in the aggressive group. The incidence of hypoglycemia was significantly higher in the group receiving aggressive control. 
However, there was no increase in morbidity as a result of these increased episodes. Next slide. In conclusion, then, this study showed that in diabetic patients undergoing cabbage surgery, aggressive glycemic control increased the incidence of hypoglycemic events but did not result in any significant improvement in clinical outcomes that could be achieved with a more moderate glycemic control regimen. Furthermore, maintaining glucose between 120 and 180 in this study resulted um, with moderate control, resulted in a serum glucose that was similar to that within the more aggressive control but without the increased episodes of hypoglycemia. Next slide. The Surgical Care Improvement Project, known as SKIP, is a national program that was undertaken to improve outcomes in surgery. And one of the core SKIP quality measures involves glycemic control following cardiac surgery. A SKIP has benchmarked at 6 a.m. blood glucose levels on post-operative days 1 and 2 be less than 200. This was to be an indicator of overall glycemic control in postoperative cardiac surgery patients. However, the relevance of a single skip measurement on the efficacy of glycemic control in patients that are already receiving continuous insulin infusion targeted to achieve a serum glucose less than 180 is unknown. Next slide. We therefore undertook a study to determine the incidence of skip outliers in patients undergoing cardiac surgery already receiving continuous insulin infusion designed to maintain serum glucose less than 180. We sought to identify the profile of those patients with skip outliers and to determine whether skip outliers with continuous infusions have increased morbidity and mortality and to attempt to identify more relevant benchmarks for determining glycemic control these cardiac surgery patients. Next slide. Our study involved 832 adult patients at the Boston Medical Center, both diabetic and non-diabetic, undergoing cabbage, cabbage and valve, and valve procedures between January 1, 2008 and April 30, 2011. All patients received a continuous insulin infusion to maintain serum glucose less than 180 that was initiated upon anesthetic induction and continued for at least 18 hours in the ICU. Next slide. Of the 832 patients that were studied, 55 patients, or 6.6, were found to be skip outliers. Factors that did not predict a skip outlier include their age, sex, hypertension, ejection fraction, hyperlipidemia, the type of surgical procedure performed, or the surgical class. Next slide. Three factors characterize patients who are more likely to be skip outliers. They're more likely to have diabetes and be insulin dependent. They had a higher preoperative hemoglobin A1C and also had significantly higher body mass index. Next slide. The most common etiologies for skip failure were inadequate transition from a continuous insulin infusion subcutaneous insulin, and a delay in initiating the insulin infusion. However, 25% of patients had no clear etiology to explain their skip failure. Next slide. Consequences of being a skip failure are shown in this slide of postoperative outcomes. Skip outliers had no significant difference in 30-day mortality, the incidence of myocardial infarction, permanent strokes, external wound infections, ventilations greater than 24 hours, multisystemic failure, or hospital length of stay. Next slide. The next two slides show the limitations of using a single skip value in determining glycemic control. This slide shows a patient who is skip compliant on postoperative days one and two. The y-axis shows the glucose measurement, and the x-axis shows the various times during the hospital course that the measurements were made. The two arrows signify the 6 a.m. glucose values on the first and second days that were used to determine skip compliance. As you can see, on both days, this patient had a certain glucose less than 200 at 6 a.m. However, if you look at its overall hospital course, 
a significant percentage of its glucose values are both above the SPS and SKIP guidelines. Next slide. On the other hand, this slide shows glucose values for a type 2 diabetic patient who is not compliant with SKIP on postoperative day 2, as shown by the arrows. Despite the fact that this patient was non-compliant on post-operative day two, he remained in compliance with the SDS guidelines for the majority of his post-operative period. Next slide. This slide shows the changes in glucose in patients who are skip compliant, patients who are day one outliers, and those who are day two outliers, and compares them to glucose values throughout their hospital course. As you can see on the left, on post-operative day number one, patients who are non-compliant with SKIP had a mean glucose of 210. However, by post-operative two, as shown by the middle bars, this value is now down to 137. In contrast, patients who are non-compliant on day two averaged 230, or were compliant on day one, having a mean glucose of 142. A more accurate method to evaluate glycemic control is shown in the mean hospital glucose in these last three bars on the right. Patients who are outliers on day one, outliers on day two, and patients who remain compliant throughout their hospital course had mean glucose values that were well within both the STF and SKIP guidelines, even though the day one outliers still had glucose levels that were slightly increased compared to the other two groups. Next slide. In summary, then, this study showed that even patients receiving continuous insulin infusion designed to target serum glucose less than 180 could still be noncompliant with SKIP. However, SKIP outliers had no increase in morbidity and mortality for a length of stay. A single SKIP benchmark to assess glycemic control is inaccurate compared to metrics which incorporate glucose values over a longer time period, such as the mean hospital glucose, which we heard from Dr. Frenary 3BG, which averages the blood glucose over the first three postoperative days. Next slide. Based on our observations, new SKIP guidelines are being formulated, which are shown in this slide. It will now be that following 18 to 24 hours, blood glucose must be less than 180. But if it is less than, if it is greater than 180, measures then can be taken to lower the value less than 180 without the institution being penalized. These new SKIP guidelines are set to start, to start sometime in the fall. Next slide. How then do we achieve these targets for glycemic control in our own practices? Achieving glycemic control in the perioperative period requires a multidisciplinary approach, which includes nursing, anesthesiology, pharmacy, surgery, and endocrinology. At our own institution, we formed a perioperative glycemic control committee. This has allowed us to achieve certain glucose levels set at 180 in the first 44 hours, 48 hours following surgery, to 94% of all our cardiac surgery patients. Next slide, please. We have found that glycemic control of cardiac surgery patients is best achieved with strategies that are instituted in the preoperative period. All patients have a hemoglobin A1C drawn prior to surgery. This helps us to identify those patients who are diabetics by the ADI criteria, which you saw are greater than 6.5, and who might be at most risk for developing postoperative hyperglycemia. Furthermore, we've also found that a number of patients without a diagnosis of diabetes will suffer from either the metabolic syndrome or have undiagnosed, undiagnosed diabetes when they come to surgery. And it's important to identify these patients preoperatively so that they can be treated appropriately during the perioperative period. Next slide. Uh, in general, all hyperglycemic medications should not be taken 12 hours prior to surgery. And patients who are taking insulin or admitted on the day of surgery should reduce their MPH insulin dose by one half to one third they should continue the basal insulin doses. And we have found that intravenous insulin is really the best method to achieve rapid and effective glycemic control in hospitalized patients who have persistent blood glucose levels greater than 180 prior to surgery. Now this slide 
It shows the management of patients in the intraoperative period. During surgery, it's important to realize that insulin resistance increases and then rapidly decreases. This insulin resistance is due to hypothermia, being on cardiopulmonary bypass, and the glucose that's found in cardiopleted solutions, and from iotropic agents. Following the discontinuation of cardiopulmonary bypass, when these factors are no longer present, insulin requirements decrease rapidly, and if they're unrecognized, severe hypoglycemia can result. We institute IV insulin drips in patients who have persistently elevated glucose levels greater than 180. Because fluctuations of glucose levels can occur more commonly during surgery, we monitor glucose levels every 30 to 60 minutes, if necessary every 15 minutes during periods of rapid fluctuation. For example, the infusion of cardioplegia during cooling and rewarming. We find it's very important to check glucose levels prior to leaving the operating room so that the appropriate changes can be made in the rate of infusion to avoid hypoglycemia upon arrival in the ICU. Next slide. Now, based on the recommendations of the STS guidelines, we feel that all patients with and without diabetes who have persistent glucose levels greater than 180 should receive continuous insulin infusion to maintain serum glucose less than 180 for the duration of their ICU care. Based on a study by Vandenberg, we also feel that all patients require more than three days in the ICU because of ventilatory dependency, the need for inotropes, intraoral balloon or LVAD support, the need for IV antiarrhythmic therapy, or renal replacement therapy should receive continuous insulin infusions, but this time to keep their sugars lower and that it should be less than 150. During the time that patients are in the ICU and receive a continuous insulin infusion, we monitor glucose levels every, every hour, and if necessary, every 15 minutes, when serum glucose levels are less than 70. Next slide, please. Our goal during the non-ICU phase of the patient's hospital stay is to maintain blood glucose levels less than 180 in the postprandial state and to maintain glucose levels between 100 and 140 in the fasting and pre-meal states. After the patients are transitioned off their IV insulin infusion, we find that this is best achieved with subcutaneous insulin that combines both intermittent acting insulin with rapid acting insulin agents. All agents are resumed when target glucose levels are maintained and the patient is tolerating a normal diet. Metformin should not be restarted until the patient is documented to have normal renal function. And lastly, we find it's very, very important that any changes that are made during the time these patients are in the hospital are communicated to local physicians, either primary care physicians or their endocrinologists. Thank you. Thank you, Harold, uh, and thank you, Tony. I think we all appreciate your pioneering efforts on glycemic control and similarly, your hard work in distilling this somewhat complex and burgeoning topic so brilliantly as you presented it tonight. There's a fair number of questions, so I think we'll just dive right in. The first one I'll direct towards you, Tony. It's a two-part question about glycemic variability from Jan Zong Sun. Um, one, what's the best way to measure glycemic variability and related to that, are there any good studies that would suggest effect on cardiac surgery outcome? Uh, thanks, Kevin. Thanks, Dr. Sun. Well, you know, if you look at it from a statistical point of view, the, the gold standard has been standard deviation around a mean glucose value as the as glycemic variability. Um, but there's a, a newer way to do it called mean amplitude of glycemic excursion mean amplitude of glycemic excursions are MAGE. And it's a MAGE index. And, and I don't want to really get into it. Um, and how comp it's fairly complex, but it's a it's the difference between it's the arithmetic arithmetic mean between the differences in the peaks and the troughs. And in order to measure MAGE, um, you really need con continuous glucose monitoring devices. And and that may turn out to be the better way to do it, but right now since we don't have CGMs or continuous glucose monitors, we really can't do that or calculate it unless you do. And um, 
although in the to answer the second part of the question, uh, glycemic variability definitively increases oxidative stress within the body. And uh, we didn't really get in much into oxidative stress too much here, but it essentially it increases the inflammatory nature, the, in, in, the inflammatory mediators within your body. And um, variations in glucose will do that. It's detrimental for patients. It's been shown to increase um, outpatient complications of diabetes. Uh, there are no studies currently uh, in the literature showing that glycemic variability alters uh, outcomes in cardiac surgery patients, but there are in IT patients. Very good. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, next one we'll direct towards you, Harold, and it's from Dr. Engelman, and it really relates to a question that many have asked, and that is transitioning from IV insulin to subcutaneous insulin. Uh, what's the most effective way to calculate those doses and handle um, or manage things on the floor? I know you addressed that, but um, maybe you could kind of reemphasize your findings and your beliefs. Yes, um, you know, we recently um, uh, published in the Journal of Cardiac Surgery, actually last year in July, a primer that we use, which actually goes through the, the calculations how we do this, and basically what it is is that we look at the amount of um, IV insulin that was required over the previous 24-hour period, and, and using that then, uh, working with our endocrinologists, we come up with both a basal dose, you know, um, for let's say glargine, um, and then a short-acting Lispro dose to compensate for that. So a lot of this is based on uh, what the IV insulin requirements are, but also taking into account uh, the fact that the patient is now uh, eating and tolerating a, uh, a normal diet. And this is a day-to-day -day thing, and actually working with our endocrinologist, uh, this will change from day to day um, until the patient is ready to uh, be discharged, and usually we find by that time they're on a more stable uh, dose of a short and lung-acting um, agent. We also find that most patients who come in and are not on um, IV insulin or not getting an insulin analog, um, even though they require IV insulin during the postoperative, perioperative period, will still go home on oral agents. And I think it's, all, it's always important to tell the patients that even though they may require IV insulin to keep them under glycemic control for the first three days in the postoperative period, that doesn't mean that they will need insulin uh, when they go home. And I think that's uh, very important for them to know that. Very good. Thank you very much. Um, Tony, you touched on our next question from David Walton, and it's something that I've thought a lot about as well, and that is the continuous glucose monitoring as well as control. Do you want to tell us what the current state and when you think we might be doing those sorts of things in clinical practice? Well, uh, Kevin and David, it's really going to depend on the FDA. Um, the current, the only current, uh, current continuous glucose monitors are subcutaneous monitors, um, and they they suffer from some uh, some lag time between the the glucose in the subcutaneous tissues and the glucose in the blood, and they also suffer currently from some inaccuracy. So, I, no one is using them right now to uh, adjust insulin levels. Um, there are a number of devices that are, are trying to get through the FDA and are in, in, in pivotal studies right now um, that directly measure blood glucose levels in a continuous fashion, like every minute, every 10 seconds, things like that. So we, we don't have them available to us now, but certainly um, when they are available, and I don't know, it's going to depend on the FDA again, whether it's five years, two years, 10 years, I don't know. Um, when they're available, it will certainly help us avoid hypoglycemia. It will help the nurses um, uh, who are managing these drips uh, not fear hypoglycemia and to dial the patients down maybe into the target range more because that's what the nurses tend to do is they tend to uh, want to stay in the upper end of the target range. And I think, and, and rightfully so, they're afraid of hypoglycemia. Um, and, and that's one of the reasons that most of the studies that have ever been done 
um, it's one of the multitude of reasons why the actual cheap glucose is higher than the targeted glucose. Kevin, I just want to say that uh, we've had some experience with these um, devices here, and, um, you know, as Tony said, they're far from perfect, and the, the thing is that most um, nurses uh, feel that, well, this might be like dialing in nitride to get to a desired um, blood pressure, but, you know, as we know, insulin will have a lag time before it becomes effective, and, and sometimes trying to uh, have a continuous output or, you know, number um, is a little bit detrimental. And, and right now the state of the art is really not there. They also differ during periods of um, hypothermia, um, base debilitation, and sometimes those things are not taken into account when these, um, these devices are put on. And calibrating them can also be a problem. So I think we're, we're still a long way from it. I, I, I don't, I, I want to disagree a little bit. I don't think we're a long way. I think we're a long way from approval. I've seen some devices that are absolutely remarkable and have uh, mean absolute relative deviations or MARD that are, are significantly better than what's available now and are uh, that, that uh, rival YSI or, or clinical chemistry. It's just getting them through the FDA. That's great. Um, I'll direct this one to Harold because I think last Tony answer. Um, it's from Guy Payone, and it's about uh, accuracy or inaccuracy in point-of-care glucose measurement. Um, gave some specifics about hypothermia, anemia, uh, pressure use, but um, I think everybody would be interested in your thoughts, experience, and recommendations about sending samples to the lab versus point-of-care. I think that, you know, at least in our institution, it's about a 10 to 15 percent difference between the point of care and the, and the labs. Uh, but as you know, the point of care can be uh, gotten instantaneously, and um, therefore they are used um, very frequently. Uh, but, for example, during periods of um, if someone has a glucose level that is low, uh, certainly the point of care can be helpful in that it will provide you with a trend but we'll always send off uh, uh, a value to the lab. Uh, and certainly every hour, every two hours, we'll be sending off a, a lab uh, specimen and, and then try to correlate with our point of care. So for each individual patient, after a while, uh, the nurse will get a, a feel for where the patient's going. And even though there may be a 10% difference, um, they'll be able to assess the fact that the point of care is actually um, pointing to a, a range that is acceptable. And so that 10 to 15 percent difference in the long run may not be too much of a problem because we're really tracking, uh, you know, outcomes over a period of time. Great. Uh, one more question. I think we have about two minutes. It comes from Alan Spear, and I'll direct it to you, Tony. Um, maybe a brief discussion about your experience, uh, thoughts, recommendations on paper protocols versus uh, computerized glucose control. Yeah, there's been a lot written about this lately. Um, as the protocols become more complex, and the more complex a protocol is, the better it is at avoiding hypoglycemia. And the more complex a protocol is, the better it is at, at, uh, at dealing with some of the inconsistencies in, in care that we have, like patients on steroids, patients going on and off dialysis, two feet, etc. The more complicated a protocol gets, the harder it is for our uh, nursing staff to follow the protocol. And um, computerized protocols tend to take some of the guesswork out of it for the nurses. They don't have to, to read down to a certain place. So when institutions have compared uh, paper protocols to computerized protocols, there's always a lower level of hypoglycemia involved. But it really comes down to the protocol that's used. It's certainly easier to use a computerized protocol, but it really comes down to the protocol. And not all protocols are created equal. So there are protocols, like our Portland protocol, that has an overall hypo, severe hypoglycemia rate of less than, at less than 40 of 1.01% uh, per patient on a patient level at a target level of 70 to 110. So with a target of 70 to 110, about 1% 1 of patients go below 40. Of those patients that went below 40 in, in, in 4,500 patients, 90% of those were due to the, the, the 
fact that a nurse at one point couldn't follow the protocol or didn't follow the protocol. So the majority of hypoglycemia is in paper protocols is caused by inability to follow the protocol by no fault of the nurse, just by fault of complexity. And computerized protocols are hopefully going to take that away. Perfect. With that, um, we're right at 7 o'clock, which I believe is the end of our discussion. But I wanted to, again, thank Tony Harrell, Dr. Prager, the SDS, Jane Hahn for supporting us. And the work that you put in is, is so obvious. It's, it's just a terrific opportunity to spread this knowledge across the globe for our patients and for our team. Um, and I do want to let everyone know that's participating that they can email questions and we'll subsequently post them uh, on the site. As we've mentioned, this talk will be posted on the SDS site and we'll do our best to um, address people's ongoing interests and concerns. With that, again, thank you very much. Have a good night.